Welcome back everyone. I hope everybody had lots of fun with the last video and watching all those strange squirrely polar graphs as they swing around and make these weird limnoscate limacon shapes and things. It's all very cool. So this time we're going to talk about how to find area you know, enclosed by those kind of weird squirrely polar graphs. And because they're they're weird and squirrely and they wiggle around and make these these really cool shapes, it makes it a little trickier to think about how do we how do we integrate that to find an area? Well, let's go back to the big idea for all of the stuff in this material. The big idea was that something was changing, right? We couldn't just use old algebra formulas. When we try these, these wiggly, squirrely polar graphs, you know, it's going to be changing a lot, right? There's no obvious shape there that we can use, you know, a formula for. But we could break this problem up into little pieces. We could pretend that well, the R in this case is constant on each of the little pieces and use the formula for for finding that kind of an area, an area of the kind of shape we get for that. We add up the pieces, that gives us a Riemann sum, and if we use more and more pieces, as they get smaller and smaller and smaller, the limit becomes a definite integral. That's the definition of what a definite integral really is. So that's awesome because um, now we have the, the problem set up correctly and the answer becomes an integral in the end. This big idea is, is what this whole section of material is about. We're going to be talking about lots of different examples of this same big idea over and over and over again. Because the truth is, you know, in my lifetime as a mathematician, I have never tried to find the area of something in polar coordinates on purpose when it wasn't in a calculus class. So why does anybody actually care? I mean, sometimes people care, and there are cases where this is useful. But the truth is, all of this is really just an excuse to beat this big idea into you over and over and over again, which is that, you know, something's changing, so we have to break it up into pieces, add up the pieces, and the answer becomes an integral. So the thing that we can do here is break our polar area up into little pieces, but they're not rectangles we're going to use little sectors. Okay? So think about what happened when we were graphing in rectangular coordinates. If we, if we changed x, so we had a little delta x, right? that would be like a little line segment running horizontally. And if we pretended that y was constant, that the function was constant, then we got a little line going horizontally up above that. And so that made a little rectangle. right? So a little rectangle is exactly pretending that um, from one break point at x to the next break point at x, a slightly different x, we, we kept the height constant, and it makes a little rectangle. Well, if we imagine graphing in polar coordinates and keeping the r constant, right, and we change our delta theta, so we go from one theta to the next, right, we, go, we change our angle from... By a, by a delta theta, but we keep r the same, what we get is a sector. So this is like a pizza slice, right? It's a slice of, of you know, a pizza. We've, we've uh, cut this up into a pizza slice from a circle. So what's the area of a pizza slice? Well, you take the area of a whole pizza and multiply by the percentage of the pizza that you have in your slice, right? That's really easy. So the area of a whole circle would be pi r squared. What percentage of the circle do we have? Well, the whole circle would be 2 pi theta, right, for theta as it goes all the way around. And we don't have a whole 2 pi, we just have delta theta. So the percentage of the circle that we have is delta theta out of 2 pi. So if I take pi r squared, multiply it by delta theta over 2 pi, that gives me the area of my pizza slice. Of course, the cool thing that happens here is the pies cancel, so there's no more pie because we're going to eat the pizza. <laughs> we're left with one half r squared delta theta. That's the area of a pizza slice, or, or more precisely, the area of a sector. So what we'll do is we'll move our theta along. We'll pretend that r is constant. That'll sweep out a little sector, and then we find the area of that sector, one half r squared will become d theta when we use smaller and smaller pieces and get an integral. So here's an example. Let's find the area of one leaf of a rose. So here's our um, 
our graph that we've played with before. And it's super important to always, 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 always graph these first. So remember a rose looked like this example had four petals and so or four leaves. So we're going to find the area of just one of them. So all we need is a part that goes from, say, negative pi over 4 to pi over 4 to get this sort of green, not note the green, the twisted sense of humor, this green leaf sitting here um, in front of us. So we break this leaf up into lots of little sectors and add up the pieces. Okay? So if we do that, the, uh, the area of each sector will be 1 half the radius squared times the delta theta. So I'd have the sum of 1 half for cosine 2 theta, all that squared, then the, d, then the delta theta in the sum, which of course becomes a d theta in my integral. So I end up with an integral 1 half for cosine of 2 theta, all that squared, d theta. And I integrate from the start of the leaf to the end of the leaf. And because I've graphed this, I know that my leaf starts at negative pi over 4 and goes around to pi over 4. Um, it might be worth pausing to ask for a second, why do I call this angle negative pi over 4 and not something like um, 7 pi over 4? Because when we graphed this earlier, that was what we would have called this angle because we would have started here, gone all the way around and come back and called this 7 pi over 4. So why the switch now? Well, the thing is this, I don't want to integrate from 7 pi over 4 to pi over 4 because that's just backwards, right? It needs to sort of, well, it break when it gets to 0 because right here, would I be calling this 2 pi or would I be calling it 0? So there's two ways around this. One is to just call this angle negative pi over 4 and don't worry about it. So then I can go from negative pi over 4 through 0 to pi over 4 and everything's fine. Another way to do this is if you're working with an area that you know is perfectly symmetric, right, like this one is, then you could cut it in half. So what I could do is integrate from 0 to pi over 4 and double it. That would also work in this case, but you have to be absolutely sure that your picture's perfectly symmetric if you're going to try to do that. Well, through most of what we've done this semester, we have not tried very hard to integrate any of these these problems we've been working on. When we were doing um, the other videos, sometimes I would say what the answer is, but we didn't go through a lot of details of how to integrate it because those were all essentially calculus one integrals we could do, and it'd just be really boring. Nobody wants to see me integrate something on the screen when you already know how to do it. But this integral is different, right? This is an integral that we don't teach people to do in our calculus two class because we have to be able to integrate a cosine squared. It's not very difficult. In fact, it's something we could have done in Calculus 1, but we don't in our Calculus 1 course here at Tech. So we're going to pause for a second in, in following through more areas and actually take a minute to integrate this, this uh, integral or evaluate this integral. Uh, remember that on your test, you generally won't have to integrate things uh, on the, the test for this part of the material. Normally on the exam I would say something like set up an integral to find the uh, the area of something or set up an integral to find the volume of something. But in this case this is the one exception where I might actually ask you to evaluate an integral on the exam because it's a new kind of integral that we didn't do in Calculus 1. So how do I actually evaluate this integral? Well okay first off we can simplify it a little bit. Um, that's 4 cosine of 2 theta, all in parentheses, squared. If I square the 4, I'd actually get 16. 16 times the half would give me an 8. So I'd end up with 8 and a cosine squared of 2 theta. So, so far so good. That helps a little. Um, the 8 doesn't really bother me. It's the cosine squared that's a problem. Because um, if I'd had an extra sign floating around out there, like cosine squared of 2 theta, and there were a sine of 2 theta out there, then I could do u substitution. But I don't have that, so I'm just sort of stuck. Well, not quite. What rides to the rescue is trigonometry. So there are two really important trig identities. So if you have not memorized all of the um, trig functions you have to know from the trig sheets, then here's an example of why you have to know them. 
So two of the identities off of that sheet are these. Cosine squared of x is 1 half 1 plus cosine of 2x. Sine squared of x is 1 half 1 minus cosine of 2x. So how do you remember these? Is there a trick to remembering them? Well, kind of. Here's my trick for remembering these two. So the form is almost exactly the same. You know, 1 half, 1, either plus or minus, cosine of 2x. So the 2x, that almost looks like the squared, kind of got sucked inside the, <laughs> kind of got sucked inside the cosine. So that almost kind of makes sense. And how do you remember which one gets the plus and which one gets the minus? So here's how I remember it. The cosine went from cosine squared, and cosine squared stays being a cosine. It becomes 1 half 1 plus cosine of 2x. The cosine squared stayed a cosine. It's happy. It gets the plus. The sine squared, it got turned into a cosine, and that makes it sad. So it gets the minus sign. Um, whatever works for you to remember these is fine, but uh, that's my trick for remembering which sign, which, which version gets the plus and which one gets the minus. Now you may notice that I wrote these identities as cosine squared of x, not cosine squared of theta. Because if you look at our problem there in red, we have cosine squared not of theta or of x, but cosine squared of 2 theta. So what actually is going to happen here is we're going to use this identity, but 2 theta takes the place of the x in the identity. In other words, if you look at the identity, what it really says is cosine squared of some stuff equals 1 half 1 plus cosine of twice that stuff. Right, let me say that again, because saying it with the stuff actually helps. Cosine squared of stuff equals 1 half 1 plus cosine of twice the stuff. Now in our example, what stuff do we have? Well, we have 2 theta. That's our stuff sitting inside the cosine. So what's going to happen is we're going to get 1 half 1 plus cosine of twice the stuff which gives me four thetas. So the whole thing becomes an integral with an eight, and then the red cosine squared becomes one half one plus cosine of four theta. Okay, how do I finish that off? Well, the half and the eight, of course, those will, those will simplify down to just being a four. That's easy enough. And now I've got an, a really easy substitution integral from calculus one I can do. So when I integrate one, I just get theta. When I integrate cosine of 4 theta, that's a substitution integral, and I'll get 1 fourth sine of 4 theta. Now I have to substitute in the pi over 4 and the negative pi over 4, and the whole thing turns out to be just 2 pi. So not terribly difficult, but also something that we don't usually cover in Calculus 1. So that's why this kind of integral is actually fair game on the exam, whereas we typically won't ask very many other kinds of integrals for you to do on the exam. Well, let's try another one. So let's find the area enclosed by, well, these two circles. So r equals 2, cos r equals two cosine theta and r equals 2 sine theta. Those are circles. If you graph those, carefully or, or look back to the last video and see how we did those, what we get are our two circles. The two cosine theta in green and the two sine theta there in red. So we want to find the area in between those. So that's this area right here where my little laser pointer is dancing around in the intersection like it's a Venn diagram or something. So first step is graph it carefully and know what we're looking at. So there's the graph. The next thing we need to know from the graph is where the intersections are. So I need to figure out where sine, 2 sine of theta is equal to 2 cosine of theta. Oh boy, how do we find that? Because that looks like, you know, lots of trig nastiness, right? How do you, you can cancel the 2's, okay, great. So where does sine equal cosine? If you think about it, you might can guess, but here's one way to solve this. Let's divide both sides by cosine. Okay. Or another way to think about it is take the cosine to the other side. That would give me sine over cosine equals 1. And what sine over cosine? Tangent. So this equation turns into tangent of theta equals 1. Now I can check what's the inverse tangent of 1. And if you remember in the last video we briefly mentioned inverse tangents and now you have to be sort of careful. 
we get one intersection point at pi over 4 in the first quadrant, which of course matches our picture, right? Because we certainly expected to see an intersection right there at an angle of pi over 4. That looks perfect. So there's our pi over 4 intersection. And r is equal to square root of 2. That looks, that looks just right. But the other intersection point happens, of course, in the third quadrant. Well, it looks like it might, right? At an angle of 5 pi over 4. But what's the r? It's negative square root of 2, which means I go backwards. It's actually showing me the same intersection twice. And that makes sense if you think back about the way we graphed those, because that circle gets, gets looped around twice when we draw the graph. So that intersection point happens twice. But one thing that's odd does happen here. This misses the intersection point at the origin, because they obviously cross at the origin too. The reason that the problem shows up here is we can only divide by sine of theta if it's not zero. If sine of theta is zero, then my little trick of solving the equation doesn't work and we get an extra solution. And so we know there's got to cross through the origin. The other thing that's going on is the red curve goes through the origin when theta is zero. The green curve goes through the origin as it comes straight down when theta is pi over two. Remember, the origin is r equal to zero and theta could be anything. So it's tricky finding that intersection point algebraically because they do cross at the same r value, when r is zero, but different values of theta. So just trying to do it with algebra won't find that intersection point. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, we graph it and we just look. Okay. So moral of the story, always, 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 always graph before you try to start hunting down areas. Okay, so the next part is always the, the part that freaks people out when they see it for the first time. It's really not that, that odd or weird that it works this way, but it just looks bizarre when you see it. Because if I want to find the area right here in the middle between these two, the, the obvious thing to do is to subtract like the top minus the bottom or the right minus the left or something that looks like what we've been doing before, right? It should be, you know, the red minus the, no wait, the green minus the, uh, Something ought to be subtracted from something, right? Well, no, because that's polar, that's rectangular coordinate thinking, and we're doing polar coordinates. So in polar coordinates, the actual answer is this. I'm going to tell you the answer, then we'll try to figure out what in the world is going on. So not only do we not subtract the green minus the red, we're actually adding stuff. What in the world does that mean? So here's what's going on. The first integral of the red part, the 2 sine theta. That goes from an angle of 0 to pi over 4. So what we're doing is we're actually doing an integral along this bottom arc of the red piece. Then the second integral goes from pi over 4, you see, to pi over 2. That's an integral along the green piece. And I'll show that half of the, the region there. What we're actually doing is finding the area inside the red part until they cross and then now we're finding the area inside the green part. Why? Why is that? Well, if you think about this from the perspective of like, like a little dude standing here at the origin and he's got his radar arm and he's drawing these graphs, as he looks out when theta is equal to zero, he doesn't start looking at, at rectangles with the top minus the bottom or the right minus the left. What he sees well, when theta is equal to zero or, or close to zero, is just the red curve. Okay? Until it reaches the intersection point, all he sees as he swings his radar arm around is the red curve. Then, when it reaches the intersection point, all he sees is the green part. So that's why we do the red part first. We find the area enclosed by it. Then we switch. We go over and we find the green part. So what we get are two areas, and we add them together. This is way different from what you might expect. I mean, the first time I saw this, I thought, this is bizarre. You ought to be subtracting something to find the area between something, right? But you don't. And how do you know to do it this way? You just have to draw the picture. Draw the picture, and imagine that you're a little man standing at the origin, drawing out these graphs using your radar arm that gets longer and shorter as theta changes, and imagine what you see. So the little man at the origin, as he draws his radar arm to graph that red circle, or to graph this intersection, 
he draws the red circle first. Then when the two curves cross, he draws the green. And that's how he would draw in polar coordinates that intersected region. Okay. Here's another sort of surprise. One last example of how we can find an area in polar coordinates. So we want to find an area outside this blue limnoscape and inside the circle. So if we draw those graphs, we get something like this. The, uh, the circle, r equals 3 cosine theta. It's a big circle. goes all the way out to 3. The limnoscape is um, the square is 2 times the square root of cosine 2 theta. At least that's half of it. There's another half of the limnoscape that would be on the, the second and the third quadrant that's not drawn because that doesn't count. We only want what's outside the limnoscape and also inside the circle. So we need to find this green area that I've drawn, not the blue area. And again, you might think, based on the stuff we did with rectangular coordinates, with um, areas and volumes and stuff, that somehow I need to subtract something to take the green minus the blue. Well, there's something to that, but the thing to think about is not how do you find the area between two curves, the way we did at the very beginning, but think about what we did when we did washers. This is almost like a really screwed up washer. I mean, actually, to me, it looks kind of like a, 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 a Cylon, right, from the old Bowser. You can imagine this. See, it scans back and forth, kind of looks like a Cylon. Yeah, okay, anyway, if, if you don't buy that, it's still a big green circle with a blue part that's missing. So all we have to do is find the area of the big green part and subtract the area of the green of the blue part that we want to get rid of. So how do I find the area of the whole green circle? Well, all the way around from the green circle, that's the integral from negative pi over 2 all the way around to pi over 2, 1 half r squared d theta. So 1 half times the green 3 cosine theta squared d theta. Then I subtract off the area of the blue part. So that's the area from the integral of 1 half r squared d theta with the blue r. 2 cosine, 2 square root of cosine 2 theta. You might notice something though, if you stare at this for a few minutes, or especially if you rewatch the video and stare at it for a few minutes, what happens right here? Suddenly, my limits of integration are not what I would guess they would be, right? It goes from negative pi over 4 to pi over 4. Why in the world have my limits changed? The answer is, I'm integrating over the whole limnoscape, right? And if you remember the graph of our limnoscape, it had a dead zone that started at pi over 4 where the things inside the square root turned negative. I'd be taking the square root of a negative number. So if you look at it really close, the, the graph actually comes in at an angle of pi over 4 here, right? So the entire limnoscape is made by swinging around for a little radar arm from 0 just to pi over 4. The graph doesn't exist between pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4 because I'd be taking the square root of a negative number. So, you know, one more time, the moral of the story, always, 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 always graph these things because if you don't have a good picture, you don't have any idea what you're looking at and you just can't plug things into formulas and expect to get the right answer. The only way this makes sense is to draw the picture and then think about how I would break it up into pieces to make an integral. And the second most important thing about this, after you've graphed it and you've got a really good picture of what you're trying to do, remember that we're breaking things up into little sectors. So we can't just do some kind of weird trick like we would do in, in um, rectangular coordinates where we subtract one thing from the other. This is bad, 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 bad. Right? It's not one curve minus the other curve and square it. It's not this at all. That's bad. We're going we're gonna to get rid of that. That's awful. Right? Because rectangles work like that, where you can subtract one piece from another piece and still have a rectangle. But if you subtract one pizza piece from another pizza piece, you don't have a pizza piece. That's why it doesn't work.